Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. So take a look at this video. It isn't from the summer of 2020 or a protest about the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, or Dante Wright, or the death of Breonna Taylor. What you are watching here is outrage over another new police killing in a city that's already all too familiar with them. I'm not sure any place encompasses the current battle for police reform more than Minneapolis, Minnesota. The city was the backdrop of the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Derek Chauvin in what would become a case study of lack of accountability, transparency, and sense of impunity that can permeate police departments. It was during Chauvin's trial in Minneapolis, just mere miles away from the courthouse, that Dante Wright was killed by Officer Kim Potter. And now, nearly a year later, as the federal trial of Chauvin's colleagues is underway, the death of Amir Locke again at the hands of Minneapolis police is upending the city. Amir Locke was a 22-year-old black man that was fatally shot by a SWAT team officer last Wednesday during an early morning no-knock raid. Police obtained a no-knock search warrant from the, for a Minneapolis apartment complex in relation to a homicide investigation. And while Amir was not the target, it took less than 10 seconds for police to enter and shoot Amir after they say he pointed a gun at the officers. So I normally don't play graphic body camera footage on air, but I think it's important in this particular case. So you can understand why advocates are questioning what police have revealed about the shooting and also calling for an end to all no-knock warrants. Minneapolis police initially said officers loudly and repeatedly announced their presence before entering the apartment. The video appears to show them announcing as they walk in. Police also said Locke pointed his gun at them. But again, that's far less clear from the actual footage of what happened. And the video highlights the pitfalls of a no-knock warrant. Neither officer nor suspect are given enough time to process what they're actually seeing before firing a gun. Maybe Amir was dropping his gun. Maybe officers could have learned that he wasn't their guy. We'll actually never know. Interim Minneapolis Police Chief Amelia Huffman held a press conference with Mayor Jacob Frey after the body camera footage was released last week, during which she defended the officers' actions by emphasizing that they had to make a split-second decision. But she was interrupted by an activist tired of the same old script. Take a look. People are asking very simple questions that have still not been answered. Amelia, you're saying you want to be the chief? Then act like it. Demonstrate integrity. Don't cover up for what those cops did. If they knew that the kid had a gun as he started waking up, say, drop your weapon. They didn't do that. No One cop opened fire and took the life of a child who was trying to go back into his blanket. Any mom can see what happened there. So I can't tolerate the whitewashing. I'm sorry, y'all. We can't do this. Joining me now is that activist you saw there, Nikema Arm Levy Armstrong. She's also a civil rights attorney and the former president of the Minneapolis NAACP. And Nikema, at that press conference, you called for accountability and said, we were watching the beginnings of a cover-up. Why do you feel that way? Well, I feel that way because the Minneapolis police uh, chief was not being transparent, in my opinion, about the circumstances surrounding the killing of Amir Locke. So, for example, um, the Minneapolis police sent the picture of the gun that was in Amir Locke's hand, along with bullets. And I felt that that was a way of um, making Amir look like a criminal, look like a suspect, when in reality, he was not a suspect in that situation. It really took Amir Locke's family actually 
sharing information about what really happened for the public to find out what really happened. If Amir Locke's family had not found out that he wasn't named in the search warrant, that he actually had a concealed and carry, that he was wrapped up in a blanket on the couch asleep when police officers entered that apartment, no one would know to this day. They would have been able to shroud the entire situation under the cover of an unfolding investigation through the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, which is what they were starting to do. Um, additionally, oh, go ahead. No, I, I want to focus in on what you said about the concealed carry permit to have the gun that it was in his possession, but also the fact that he's not named in the warrant. Those are two significant details and facts in this particular case that make it different from any of the other cases we've talked about in recent years. Talk about why those two details specifically and are so important and, the, and, and reiterate what you just explained, which is the family is the, is the vehicle through which we learn this information, not the police department. Absolutely. And so thankfully, um, I know Amir Locke's cousin who is pretty well known in our community, and actually so is his father. And so after, uh, I got a call actually that morning from interim chief Huffman, along with maybe a dozen individuals or organizations, letting us know that police had killed someone, they were executing um, a search warrant on behalf of apparently the St. Paul Police Department. And um, at that time they said, you know, and they entered the apartment and the suspect had, or the person had a weapon. And it was really intimating that they had gone in, it was a dangerous situation. They had a suspect who pointed a gun at cops and the cops had no choice but to kill that person. However, when Amir's cousin called me, um, later that evening, she actually relayed several key pieces of information, including Amir Locke's name, the fact that he was under 25 years old and all the details I just mentioned. And they gave me permission to post this information on Facebook. And that is how the media found out, the news found out, the information came directly from the family. So, yes, we were um, experiencing a cover-up. Um, additionally, in November of 2020, the uh, mayor, Jacob Fry, um, issued a statement saying that he had essentially, like, banned no-knock warrants, um, with the exception of very limiting circumstances. So people were expecting no-knock warrants to only be used in an extremely exigent circumstance or a case of a hostage or something like that. Not this kind of situation, which the body camera footage bore out that looked like a scene from a horror movie, where you have officers using a key to enter an apartment and creeping in, and there was literally nine seconds from the time that they entered to the time that they killed Amir. They also, when they found Amir sleeping, one cop kicked the couch. That's how Amir woke up. He literally had two seconds to react. And how did he react? He just looked up. He had his gun in his hand, not on the trigger. He had his gun on the barrel like a disciplined gun owner. And he had no chance to do anything, not even to breathe, not even to fully wake up, not even to say anything before police unnecessarily and violently took his life. So there's been a lot of conversation because of this case about no-knock warrants and as a policy question whether or not that is that is the right way for the police to behave. In the case of Breonna Taylor in 2020, she was also killed by police during a no-knock raid. Um, 2022, we see a Mayor Locke killed by uh, someone in a no-knock raid. Uh, Corey Bush's tweet, which we're putting on the screen, essentially makes this point. I mean, talk about the policy changes that we actually need, so, because I can't... If somebody barges through my front door in the middle of the night and say I am a legal gun owner, my first thought is somebody is breaking into my house, not it's the police. So speak to the policy question as to whether or not no-knock warrants are even good policy. Absolutely. Well, number one, I think that no-knock warrants should be banned across the board. We have heard about the case, the tragic case of Breonna Taylor being killed um, while police were trying to get into her home, trying to execute a no-knock warrant uh, on behalf of someone who didn't even live there. Her significant other opened fire, thinking that they were facing a home invasion. 
And the police fired back without even announcing themselves and killed a young black woman. Here we see a young black man um, in the comfort of his relative's home, in a deep sleep, and then police enter in and decide to take him out. And he was a licensed gun owner. I am a licensed gun owner. And what I have said in other press conferences is, listen, I can't guarantee that if someone came into my house, I wouldn't be in the same situation as a mirror lock with my hand on my gun, ready, thinking that it is an intruder or someone who's trying to harm me. So when it comes to black folks, the message is sent that we don't have the right to bear arms as per the Second Amendment. A black man with a gun, a black man with a cell phone, a black man who's walking, a black man who's driving, a black man who's minding his own business is too often seen as a threat. And that is evident in what happened with the mere lock. But beyond that, in addition to Rihanna Taylor and Amir Lott, thousands of families experience no-knock warrants every year, particularly low-income Black families. And it may not have resulted in someone being killed, but it has resulted in extreme trauma, people's homes being torn apart, uh, children being petrified, and there is no accountability, no transparency, no changes to policies and laws. That has to end now. So the federal government needs to ban no-knock warrants, and states need to ban no-knock warrants as well. We mentioned at the top that this is happening in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, where so many other cases that we've paid attention to since the racial reckoning in 2020 have occurred. And the judge, Peter Cahill, who oversaw George Floyd's murder trial, we learned that the judge signed this no-knock warrant. I mean, what does it say about the systemic nature of this issue. It's not just police we have to think about when we're thinking about the policy changes. I mean, the same judge was sitting over the trial and signed this particular warrant. Well, Zerlina, there's something we say in the streets when we're out there protesting, and it's the whole damn system is guilty as hell. And that's what this case demonstrates from the person who, the judge, who signed off on the warrant to the actions of the SWAT team to the actions of the chief trying to cover up, as long with the mayor, to the actions of the people who are complicit when these things happen, when they fail to hold elected officials accountable. This is Jacob Fry's second term as mayor. The first term, he saw the murder of George Floyd in a worldwide outcry. And yet we still have no significant policy changes. And other people have been killed as well. Um, by police in the city of Minneapolis. And I think we lost sound for a second, but so we're going to have to leave it there. But Nikima Levy, thank you so much for being here to start us off on this really important story. We'll be closely following, uh, I am sure, any developments that come. Thank you, and please stay safe. Donald Trump's campaign for president in 2016 relentlessly portrayed his rival, Hillary Clinton, as a straight-up criminal. Remember all the lock her up chants at Trump rallies and even at the Republican National Convention? I will not forget. <laughs> How could you? And then there was this moment at the second presidential debate. When you talk about apology, I think the one that you should really be apologizing for and the thing that you should be apologizing for are the 33,000 emails that you deleted and that you acid washed. I remember that debate. Of course, like so much else that comes out of Trump's mouth, it was not true. Hillary Clinton's staff were told back in 2014, when she was Secretary of State, to delete personal emails, and the FBI found no evidence any work emails were intentionally deleted. But Trump kept riling up his crowds over Hillary's emails even after he was elected president. So it's especially ironic to learn that as president, Trump routinely violated the Presidential Records Act, which is a whole law. The Washington Post reports that he tore up everything, including briefings, schedules, and memos. Again, against a law. Sometimes he'd do it with one or two big dramatic tears of the documents. Illegal. Other times, he'd tear them into tiny little pieces. Illegal. <laughs> The problem was so, it was so bad that his staff often had to tape the documents back together with tape because that, that is what the law, like I said, requires, retaining all presidential records. In fact, some documents turned over to the House Committee on January 6th appear to have been torn apart 
and like I said, taped back together with scotch tape. We also now know that Trump removed 15 boxes of presidential documents from the White House and took them to his estate in Mar-a-Lago. And the National Archives had to actually go to Mar-a-Lago last month to go retrieve them, which just sounds illegal. So joining us to figure out if it is, is Glenn Kirshner, former federal prosecutor and an NBC News legal analyst. And Glenn, I worked for Hillary Clinton. I know what they were alleging. They were alleging that she broke this particular law. So put this in perspective for us. What is your reaction to this news of Trump routinely tearing up presidential documents and the fact that they had to go to Mar-a-Lago and get 15 boxes of records that he should have preserved for the archives? Is there, Lena, it's yet another example of Donald Trump accusing others of the misdeeds and crimes he actually commits. One of the challenges here is the Presidential Records Act has no teeth. It has no enforcement mechanism. It has no criminal penalties. So it's a lot like the Hatch Act, which prohibits federal government employees from participating in political activities. But if they do, it's like, oh, well, well, you can't serve in the federal government again in the future. So Donald Trump is not dissuaded from committing crimes that have actual criminal penalties attached. Do we really think he cares one whit about violating the Presidential Records Act? Um, now, there are some other potential federal laws that apply. There's 18 U.S.C. 2071, concealment, removal, or mutilation. That's the word of the statute of certain federal records and documents. He may very well have violated that. Um, and, and it seems like, though, he was doing this with impunity. As you just indicated, he's got some records at Mar-a-Lago. He's tearing records up. He's having staff put records in burn bags and sent over uh, to the Pentagon to be burned. And, you know, I thought back to Omarosa's book, because recall a couple of years ago, when she said she walked into the Oval Office on one occasion, Michael Cohen was in there. What does Donald Trump do? He pops a piece of paper in his mouth, which she, she said she found very unusual because she knows him to be a germaphobe. So apparently Trump would also use his mouth as a paper shredder, right? So he doesn't, he, he seems to commit all of these misdeeds, if not crimes, with impunity. Why? Because he hasn't been held accountable for a single one. So why would he alter his behavior? Let's hope that changes soon. With the scope and breadth of the investigation being conducted by the House Select Committee, hopefully at least a covert piece of an investigation underway at the Department of Justice, you know, hopefully all of these misdeeds and crimes will soon come home to roost. So you said that the Presidential Records Act doesn't have an enforcement mechanism but I recall that they used to say Hillary was going to get locked up. That was their chance. So were, th were they saying then she was going to get locked up under a law that doesn't have that as an enforcement mechanism? That's my first part to the question. And the second part is, is that covert investigation at the DOJ, is that happening? I mean, do we have any evidence that that is happening, given the fact that every time we talk, we're talking about laws Donald Trump potentially violated? Yeah, to answer your, your first question, Zerlina, you know, they chanted lock her up, you know, mindlessly, not knowing or having any indication that Hillary Clinton violated any law. There's no indication she did. But the lock her up chant made them feel good, just like the build a wall in Mexico will pay for it chant made them feel good, none of which was realistic or based in fact. With respect to your second question, the, the covert aspect of the DOJ investigation. I guess there's a bit of a catch-22, because if it's covert, we wouldn't know about it. But there are so many things that the federal government can be doing. For example, they could be running what we call T3, Title III wiretaps, where they get court permission to surreptitiously listen in to the phone conversations. And that's particularly important when you have people who don't tend to put a lot of things in writing texts, emails, like Donald Trump. So if it were me, I would certainly have started this investigation into the crimes of Trump and company covertly. And I would have exhausted the covert 
tools available to me. And then at some point, I would have to start issuing grand jury subpoenas, which runs the risk of the investigation sort of seeping into the public square, courtesy of leaks or otherwise. So, you know, but if I have a moment to talk about the House Select Committee investigation, we <laughs> really need to remember that the chief investigative counsel is a gentleman named Tim Heafy. He was a contemporary of mine and my colleague at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. He went on to be the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. And let me tell you, Zerlina, Tim was not only a masterful tactician in his grand jury investigations, he was fearless. He actually was one of the trial prosecutors on the largest RICO trial ever prosecuted in the courts of Washington, D.C. And the way I see this investigation unfolding, where Mark Meadows says, I'm going to thumb my nose at the subpoena, fine. You know what we're going to do? We're going to subpoena and we're going to investigate all around Mark Meadows with those closest to him. And there's some indication the House Select Committee is doing it. So at the end of the day, they're going to have just as much information about what Mark Meadows did as if they had Meadows testify himself. Of course, he's been referred for criminal prosecution, and it may be that he's going to back his way into a conspiracy indictment as well. Good question. It's always a pleasure to have you. We tear up my script, stay on theme for the segment. But I also want to, as a serious note, I just want everybody to think about the first two conversations we had, because Amir Locke violated no laws, and we're just always talking about potentially laws Donald Trump violated and has received absolutely no punishment whatsoever, no accountability under the law. And that's something to think about as we go to break. Thank you, Glenn, for being here. Please stay safe. Coming up, the push on the hill to uni unionize. We'll take a look at some of the key issues staffers want to deal with. We'll be right back. When we talk about the work of Congress, we usually think of the people who are elected to the House and Senate. But behind every single member of Congress is a group of staffers who do a lot of the work keeping our government and our democracy functioning. They research and draft complex laws, respond to constituents' needs, and do so much more. We don't usually hear much from congressional staffers because they do so much of their work completely behind the scenes and out of public view. But that seems to be changing. An Instagram account called Dear White Staffers is calling attention to allegations by congressional staffers about low pay, hostile work environments, and racial and gender discrimination. The account is anonymous, and we have not verified the authenticity of the posts. But this comes at a time when congressional staffers have announced a plan to organize a union. Union organizers say that working conditions for congressional staff vary from one office to another. But one problem in particular for junior staffers appears to be they're not making enough money. They're, they're talking about low pay. Roughly one out of every eight congressional staffers makes less than a subsistence wage, according to one report. And one problem with the low pay is a failure to recruit people of color who can't work for just a little bit of money. Only about 3% of top Senate staffers are black and fewer than 4%. Our Latinx. Joining us now, Kurt Bardella. He's a former Republican congressional aide and is now an advisor to the DNC. Also with us, Sir Michael Singleton, a political analyst. Kurt, I'll start with you. Why is this happening now that congressional staffers are actually coming out in public and speaking out and trying to form a union? Does it have anything to do at all with the political polarization in Congress or the insurrection? What, what is this about? I think it's a lot about a lot of things, really, Zerlina. I mean, you have the combination of the toxic political environment. You have, after January 6th, staffers feeling, and rightfully so, like they were in harm's way, and there's no protection for them. We have seen time again. You know, I worked on the Hill for the better part of a decade, and, and I've heard and seen firsthand so many examples and stories of abuse of power, of workplace harassment, of disrespect, of just no actual standard that's uniform across the halls of Congress. And you have a bunch of people who are asked to work long hours for not enough money and no security, no recourse to actually take an issue of legitimate workplace harassment anywhere. Uh, it, Capitol Hill's been a fiefdom that's been run for so long by so few in power. 
And I think enough is enough. And we're seeing now, whether it's in the halls of NBC, whether it's the, st the, the staffers at the DCCC, we're seeing a real reckoning happen in political and media institutions for workplace unionization. Sure, Michael, why do you think there's such a lack of diversity among congressional staff? Those numbers are abysmal. I mean, no, they are abysmal, and, and this is a problem on the Republican side and the Democratic side. But what surprises me, I will say, outside of black members, Zerlina, it surprises me that so many white members who are Democrats don't have a lot of people of color representing the districts that they represent, particularly when people of color vote overwhelmingly, particularly black people, for Democrats when compared to Republicans. So I think a lot of the complaints from some of the black staffers in particular are very, very alarming. You have a lot of black staffers who are leaving Capitol Hill, particularly some of the older ones who are getting better jobs in the private sector, more money. I get it. God bless Kurt for working there for 10 years. It's the reason why I never worked on Capitol Hill is Atlanta, because the money doesn't, they don't pay well. And I like money, so I never decided to take the job. But I do <laughs> think you should pay people for their knowledge, for their experience, for the work that they're doing. And the reality is, and Kurt, you know this very well, those members aren't writing the bills. They're not reading through the legislation. It's those staffers who are spending hours and hours yeah. writing that stuff, doing the research, and putting together mm -hmm. briefing documents to brief those members so they have talking points, Z, to come on shows like yours. Pay the people what they're worth. <laughs> I know you like money, Sir Michael. Anybody who's seen your, your outfits knows you like money. Um, <laughs> um, so, and this piano, but one of the things too. is to follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kurt, you're well-dressed as well. No shade, but I'm just saying, Kurt Michael, he wears expensive clothes, uh, is the inside I'm joke. not in his um, league. Sure, Michael, just, just to follow up on the point about low, low pay, I mean, speak mm -hmm. to how that impacts the ability of staffer of, of color to even take this job in the first instance, because we talk about income inequality all the time. Mm -hmm. But sure, Michael, also that they're not being promoted to jobs which maybe they could make right. a living wage. No, that's a really, really good point. I mean, first of all, living in D.C. is expensive as heck. I mean, you're talking about an average rent mm -hmm. of one bedroom is maybe about $2,000 to $2,500. And I'm probably being generous with those numbers. You're also talking about a lot of black recent college graduates who graduate from HBCUs, which are typically very expensive. They're usually the first in their families to graduate. They're trying to also pay down student loans, pay for rent, pay for a car if they can even afford it, pay for health insurance if they want private health insurance versus what they're given from the government because of their jobs. I mean, Zerlina, the reality is it, it, it's an environment that is just not beneficial for black recent college graduates who may want to make a difference in their communities back home because they realize that people are struggling, because they realize that they need people to provide better resources by better, um, better um, telling members this is legislation that you should support versus legislation that they shouldn't support. And so, again, I think it's a toxic environment that is not conducive for black people who may want to make a difference in this country. And that has to change. And Zerlina, really quickly, that's not about being a Republican or a Democrat. That's about treating people fairly. Yeah. I don't think this is a partisan mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. So, Kurt, to that point, I mean, what do we do to actually get congressional staff that reflects the diversity of the country? We talk a lot about getting people who are elected that look like the country, but certainly the people who work on Capitol Hill need to look like the country. Well, that's why I think this unionization effort is so important, because that's part of at the heart of why they're saying this needs to happen, that there needs to be a concerted effort for retention, for diversity, for inclusiveness, for meritocracy. And that, that I think getting to that point starts with this type of organization. It starts with staffers actually being able to come together and have a voice and to take back some of the power. At the heart of this issue has always been, there's been an imbalance of power. If you're a junior staffer, just out of college, making $28,000 a year and working 60 hours a week, if something isn't right in your office and you complain, you get labeled a troublemaker. You get labeled difficult to work with. You can't get another job after that one. And then your career is pretty much over. So people stay silent. People stay quiet. They keep it to themselves. And the problems continue to fester. That's been the culture on Capitol Hill since the beginning of Capitol Hill. And in order to break that cycle, staffers have got to have a place where they can come together, centralize, have the power back, create safeguards in place where they can go with complaints. They can go and have a legitimate process that treats them with dignity, respect, and actually respects outcomes. And I think that's why we're having this unionization effort right now. Sure, Michael, how common is it for, for staff on Capitol Hill to have issues with 
you know, being demeaned or disrespected by their congressional bosses or even their just their legislative director or chief of staff? Oh, very often. And I'm sure Kurt has heard many stories from his friends. I've heard many stories and still hear stories of certain members on both sides of the aisle who do not treat their staff as right at all. And being a person of, of color, whether you're of Asian descent or Latino descent or of African descent, we're less likely, Zerlina, to want to say something because, again, we're like, oh, my God, this is an incredible opportunity for me. I don't want to be blackballed, like Kurt was just saying. I don't want to lose this mm -hmm. job because my family is dependent on me to be that success story, right? And so we're reluctant to complain out of fear of retaliation. Again, you, you can't have environments like this where people are afraid to say, hey, I'm not being treated fairly. This is not right. This needs to change. And so I think it's a positive thing that these members are coming, or that these staffers rather are coming together to say, you know what, enough is enough. This is a new day. We want to be paid fairly. We want to be treated fairly. That's the least that we can expect as staffers who are working again 60 plus hours a week. Zerlina, that's absolutely absurd for someone to work that much and only get paid $30,000 a year. You cannot survive in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. on $30,000 a year. No, you cannot. I've done it in my 20s. I was a paralegal. I, w I didn't work on Capitol Hill. And I lived in New York City. And let me tell you, it's not actually, you really can't do it. <laughs> you really can't. No. Um, Kurt Bidella and Sir Michael Singleton, thank you so much for being here. And please stay safe. Thanks, Z. Coming up. Thank you. Coming up. New Jersey's governor is lifting mask mandates in schools, but is it safe for the children? I'll talk to the state's former health commissioner and ask him exactly that question. Plus, the NFL, NFL's commissioner speaks out about former head coach Brian Flores' allegations of racist hiring practices in the league. We'll be right back. I was really going to do, like, the wax on, wax off thing, but I just, I'm not. Mask on, mask off. It's what many parents across the country consider each morning before sending their kids off to school, especially as the number of states with school mask mandates dwindles. Here's a look at the states currently that have mask mandates in schools. That is not very many. Today, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Delaware Governors announced they are lifting mask mandates in child care settings within the next few weeks. And other states, including New York and Rhode Island, are considering removing their mandates as well. But you know what my concern is? Is this movement rooted in science or is this just politics and people folding to political pressure? Joining me now is Dr. Sharif El Newhall. He's the president of University Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. So, doctor, what is the science telling us? Should states be lifting mask mandates in schools right now? Well, thank you so much for having me. What we're seeing right now are very encouraging trends with case levels of the Omicron variant. Just to give you an idea, the rate of transmission, which is a metric we look at to see if the virus is spreading faster than it's receding, is well below one. When it's above one, you get really concerned about transmission. When it's below one, you don't. And in New Jersey, it's about 0.52, which is actually really good. That means that cases are going down significantly. So not only do I think it's good timing, the governor here in New Jersey did leave another 30 days for things to get even better. Uh, he does have the authority to call another public health emergency and extend it if needed, if something very unexpected comes, like an explosion of the BA2 variant. But right now, cases do look good, and people do uh, do well with breaks, certainly when we don't have these big surges of the virus. In terms of the immune compromise and folks that they're still vulnerable, even though there are vaccines and many millions of people have been vaccinated, in terms of mask, mask mandates to protect them, is that one way to think about them at this point and, and removing them? Does it put them in any more danger? Well, it's extremely important to protect immunocompromised folks, as well as the elderly, the two highest risk groups of individuals, which, of course, fall under many different stripes and categories. Uh, folks who are immunocompromised do qualify for four shots, and they should be getting four shots. And we should certainly be getting the oral therapeutics as quickly as possible to every possible location where immunocompromised and elderly people might be. If we're able to do both of those things before these mass mandates are lifted, then I do think that it would be an overall safer environment for them. And it's, of course, extremely important to protect that population. Should this be based on vaccination status? You can only take your mask off if you've proven that you've been fully vaccinated? 
I think the more important metric is actually community level vaccination rates, especially when we're now uh, close to levels of herd immunity, arguably, when it comes to the Omicron variant spreading so much. And of course, vaccinations, which are now widely available. In fact, New Jersey is well over 85 percent of everybody eligible who've gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. And there's a big contrast across the country for vaccination levels. Uh, but we're certainly in a, a, at a point where community immunity is actually at a high enough point where I think this is appropriate. So New Jersey is one state in, you know, a sea of many, right? And we showed the mask there that there, there's only a handful that still have mask mandates. So if New Jersey has that high vaccination rate and New Jersey's transmission is low, what does that mean for the rest of the country, right? So. Every state is not in the same grid position that New Jersey is in. Do we still need to sort of overprotect and keep masks even longer because, you know, Texas exists and airplanes do too? Yeah, it's a very important point. I think, again, uh, the local immunity levels from vaccination really do matter. And so uh, I'd be more skeptical about doing this in a state where you have uh, lower vaccination rates uh, for that reason. But I do think the Omicron variant did change the picture of immunity in this country and across the world. Uh, if you got it, if you were unvaccinated and you survived it, uh, you are immune for at least a period of time. And so I do think we will see uh, significantly receding rates in the next couple of months. Uh, please, God, help that be the case because we've been wrong before. But that's what epidemiologists are projecting. And so at least giving a reprieve, if you can, for a period of time uh, to parents when it comes to masking in schools and certainly adults individually when they're going into public places makes sense where we're in the troughs of the wave of this virus. So as a parent yourself, will you be sending your kids to school with a mask, even if the, the, lift, the state's uh, mandate is lifted next month? Or are you comfortable, given all of the, the data you just laid out, sending them without? I will be. My six-year-old daughter is fully vaccinated. That certainly uh, gives me a lot of, um, you know, peace of mind when it comes to this decision. Uh, and she will be going to school in a place where a lot of folks may not be masked. But again, an overall lower community transmission levels. And uh, my kid being fully vaccinated, I will be comfortable sending her to school. Dr. Alnula, thank you so much for being here and helping us talk through this. This is a debate I'm sure is happening all over the country in every household and every state and every locality. So it's great to have you on. Please stay safe. Thank you again. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell broke his silence over the weekend on the controversy surrounding former Dolphins coach Brian Flores' lawsuit against the NFL. Flores is, Flores is suing the league and three of its teams alleging racial discrimination within their hiring process. In a move with the appearance of a united front, all three of those teams, the Dolphins, Broncos, and Giants, along with the NFL, denied Flores' allegations. And then Roger Goodell entered the chat. In a memo Goodell sent Saturday to the heads of all 32 teams, he wrote, in part, we have made significant efforts to promote diversity and adopted numerous policies and programs which have produced positive change in many areas. However, we must acknowledge that particularly with respect to head coaches, the results have been unacceptable. And that's right. After saying Flores' allegations were without merit, Goodell then agreed the league has failed to make progress on diversity among head coaches. No contradiction there, I suppose. Flores' legal team isn't buying it, though. They issued a response to Goodell's memo, quote, saying, more of a public relations ploy than real com a real commitment to change. And joining me now to break this all down is Brandon Scoopy Johnson. He's an analyst at Ballet Sports Network. So what is your initial reaction to Roger Goodell's memo? I'm conflicted um, because I definitely think that when you look at the head coaches and head coaching practices as it relates to the Rooney rule and, and other things, it has not really benefited people of color. Um, and, and I think that there needs to be a better job taken in actually finding people who are qualified. Um, I, I definitely think that when you look at other sports leagues, pr pr particularly the NBA, um, they've been more progressive as it relates to their hiring practices. When you look at the their hiring of coaches this past offseason, I think six or seven of those head coaches were black men and they were qualified. And so when you look at the NFL, I think the Rooney rule is something that people use 
uh, to kind of sound as if you're progressive, but sounding and looking are two different things. It kind of goes back to what your parents say, uh, believe what you see, not what you hear. I mean, tell us more about the Rooney Rule, right? Because I think that, you know, if you've, if you've never heard this before, this sounds good, but under the surface, as you're sort of explaining here, and I want you to sort of unpack this, it doesn't actually result in more diverse hiring. And I don't know. I'm a nascent. I don't really watch the NFL as much as I watch other sports leagues. I imagine a league that's this percentage of black players has a lot of people that would be qualified to coach an NFL team in some capacity. So why is it that the Rooney Rule isn't resulting in a more diverse slate of coaches in the NFL. So in layman's terms, essentially the Rooney Rule injects the notion that you interview people of color, particularly black men, uh, to be in a position to talk with the teams like the Patriots, the Giants, the, the Cincinnati Bengals, the, 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 the Los Angeles Rams, if you will, uh, before maybe they talk to some of those other counterparts who may not be of color. And so what happens is you look at these general managers or these owners, they actually talk to um, the, those potential head coaches, coaches uh, in those positions, and then they may go on to somebody else. So in turn, you're doing the interview process, you're doing the due diligence, but you still may not hire um, that particular candidate. And so um, I, I think in, in answer to your question, I think there's a myriad of ways I can answer it. I don't know if we have enough time on this program, but mm -hmm. I do think that when you look at the, the the makeup of the NFL and how many people are black, particularly wide receivers, running backs, and even quarterbacks, I think that there needs to be um, more of a concerted effort to find qualified candidates. It's no different than if you're in media. You know, you hire who you know. So oftentimes, you hire your friends, you hire your girlfriends, you hire your, your cousin, baby, mama's best friend, you know, people who you know. So in this case, they just don't happen to be Black. And so I think in this instance, you, you got to kind of dig a little bit harder than, than what you've, you, you've done. And I think, just, I think just in today's climate, the optics are not good. Even if you're sending out press releases, even if you're saying, we're sorry, um, a lot of people from Missouri, you got to show them. Well, I think it's, a, it's the difference between saying, like, I'm going to try to do something. You know, like, if you're like, I'm going to try to work out today. You're not going to work out. You better put that workout on your schedule because I'm working at 2 o'clock, right? Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And, like, I'll try to hire more diverse coaches, but then you just you won't. You're not going to. You need a quota. You need a goal. And it needs to be specific. So The Guardian wrote a piece that the NFL is a microcosm, essentially, saying that it represents what's happening in the country. Um, and black people see some progress, but... Then they always face a backlash. The article cites the racial process of reconstruction followed by century-long backlash of lynching and voter suppression and other Jim Crow and discriminatory laws. Do you see a parallel between what's happening in the NFL just in terms of representation among head coaches and other uh, coaching staff and just what's going on in the country? Yes, because I think for a long time, um, it's been unchecked. It's been, I mean, these are conversations that we were all having at our kitchen table. You got to be 10 times better to be what half is deemed half as good. And I think that in this instance, um, I think this us being in the house, COVID, George Floyd, and many of the other racial uh, things that have been called to the carpet, I, I think this is just another instance of people calling out. And I think that in this instance, there's a lot of people who have felt slighted uh, in, in, in positions of, of, of prominence, particularly being a head coach of a football team. It's no different than your parent or your aunt or your uncle being slighted for a position that you knew you had the education, the background, and somebody else got the job just maybe because maybe they they were they were part of a fraternity or they were part of a, 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 a or they knew somebody who gave a reference. I think I think that's just life that doesn't make it right. But I think in this instance, um, someone spoke out, and you don't get that change unless someone speaks out. And unless something's done about it. And I think in a week where we're supposed to be talking about the Cincinnati Bengals and the LA Rams and the Super Bowl uh, this week, and then last week we're talking about Tom Brady's retirement, we're supposed to be talking right. about the game on Sunday. We're not supposed to be talking about Flores. We're not supposed to be talking about lawsuits. Like, and to put on a Super Bowl show with black talent also doesn't mean that we've evolved because we're more than just entertainers. 
We, 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 mm-hmm. we definitely should be in positions. And we even saw that at the quarterback position. For many years, that position was highly coveted as just not a position that you saw a black man play. He wasn't smart enough. He didn't pass the Wonder League test. He didn't do this. So I, I think where we are right now as a society, I think everybody can cancel as much as they want to. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. uh, money talks, foolishness walks. And in this instance, the foolishness may cause some teams and some organizations to have to pony up some money. Look, I think it's a good point that we are not talking about the upcoming Super Bowl. We're talking about this. Scoop, thank you so much again, as always, for being here today and discussing this with us. Please stay safe. The world has been waiting to see missing Chinese tennis star Peng Shui. And over the weekend, she actually did her first formal interview with Western media. In an interview with a French sports outlet, Peng thanked international athletes and the Women's Tennis Association for reaching out and claimed her apparent disappearance was, quote, a huge misunderstanding. She also denied her initial sexual assault claim against a top Chinese Communist Party official that led to the global outcry, saying, I never said anyone had sexually assaulted me in any way. Peng also formally announced her retirement from the sport of tennis. I think it's important to note a few things here. Peng was accompanied to the interview by Chinese officials. The French news outlet agreed to submit questions in advance of the interview, and her answers in Chinese were translated by a Beijing Olympic Committee official. Important context there. Coming up, black American consumers are spending more money than ever before, but how do we get the racial wealth gap to actually reflect that? We'll be right back. So I have some good news, and I also have some bad news. The good news is the economic power of black people has never been higher. A recent report from the University of Georgia says the spending power of African Americans has risen to $1.6 trillion just over the last year. That means the ability of black people to buy, save, and invest has increased by 171% since 2000. But now for the bad news. The bad news is that none of this is doing much to help close the racial wealth gap. Black households still hold less than 3% of wealth in the country, despite accounting for nearly 16% of the U.S. population. Only about a third of black households own equity investments like stocks, compared to 61% of white families. And of course, there is racism, which according to one Citigroup estimate, estimate costs the U.S. economy more than 16 trillion dollars. There is no one way to fix the racial wealth gap, but what could help is having representation among the group of federal leaders whose job it is to promote a healthy U.S. economy. Right now, all of the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors are white, but President Biden is actually trying to change that. He nominated economist Dr. Lisa Cook to the board. She's a black woman who would bring to the board a career steeped in equitability and inequality research. But of course, she's facing pushback from some Republicans who have accused her of liberal advocacy. Joining me now to discuss is David Clooney, the executive director of the Black Economic Alliance. And David, Lisa Cook had already published research on how federal policy could help improve economic growth through better opportunities for people of color and communities of color. So speak to how having someone with that focus and background at the Fed the Federal Reserve, could help close the racial wealth gap. Well, Zelina, thank you for having me on. And I think you you framed it properly in the lead-in in that this is a huge missed opportunity for the economy to close the racial wealth gap. You know, beyond the city report that you noted, there's also a recent Brookings report that showed the U.S. economy has lost $51 trillion of GDP output since 1990 as a result of racial inequality. So uh, at the Fed in the you know, more than 100 year history of the Federal Reserve, you've only had, we've only had three black Federal Reserve governors. Um, there have been almost 100 in the 108 year history. And uh, we, uh, the Black Economic Alliance, alongside our partners at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, the National Urban League, and a number of other uh, black led organizations, uh, were very adamant with the administration about the opportunity and the need to have more representation around the table of seven Federal Reserve governors so that when we're setting banking policy, when we're setting 
um, monetary policy. And when we're talking about what full employment for the U.S. economy looks like, we have you know, people with the proper lived and professional experience to understand exactly what we're going through with racial inequality right now, with income inequality, and to have both Dr. Lisa Cook um, and Dr. Philip Jefferson, who is the, a, a unique and rare mix of an economist who has done both, uh, is an expert in macroeconomics and monetary uh, policy, but also uh, has studied uh, in, intensely in income inequality and poverty. That's exactly the kind of perspective we need, and we need uh, folks bringing that perspective to banking policy uh, and, and to everything that the Fed does. Why is there such a big disconnect between spending power and wealth? I mean, black people hold 10 percent of the nation's spending power, but only 3 percent of its wealth. Is that only because of representation? What are, what are some of the factors that lead to those numbers and that disparity? Now, again, I think you touched on this in your lead in. You know, s systemic racism has led up to generational gaps in wealth building. And, you know, if we think about just two examples after the um, well, first of all, black people have been in this country for over 400 years. Almost two thirds of that time was in bondage. So let's start there. Um, for the, the time that we have been you know, out of slavery, uh, obviously there were legal and significant barriers put uh, in front of us uh, that were really obstacles to us getting involved and having full participation in the democracy of America as well as the economy. And I would venture to say um, those obstacles are not completely gone. We've never achieved full participation. Uh, and the two examples I would cite, uh, you know, as instructive are after the, uh, the New Deal, after the Great Depression, um, as well as the GI Bill, two of the fastest avenues to wealth building, particularly focused on um, home ownership. And, you know, the Federal Housing Administration that was created by the National Housing Act of 1934, for over 30 years, um, the loans, the federally backed uh, affordable home loans that were given by the government, 98% of those loans went to white borrowers. So you think about the multiplier effect and the generational impact of wealth building that was created over generations and passed on over generations. Uh, and even the reality, you know, we, we know um, appraisal bias, you know, the reality that black homes either in black neighborhoods or that, you know, have uh, uh, kind of instances of, of black art and black pictures around them, uh, are in fact valued lower uh, than, and, and there have been blind studies done on that recently to show that um, race is a factor in driving down the, the value of a home. So it, it is really structural and it is really generational. Um, and, and what we're trying to do in the Black Economic Alliance is build a new infrastructure uh, for wealth building that intentionally goes to some of these obstacles, removes them, and creates pathways for Black people to build wealth at scale. Just in the last minute here, what is what does that infrastructure look like? I mean, for those folks watching at home, how do how how do they become not another statistic in in this disparity, and how do they attempt to at least start to build and increase their own net worth? So I think we've seen some promising things uh, post George Floyd, and you know the the just historical and unprecedented. Uh, rhetorical and uh, financial commitments that have been made by the private sector around lending to black uh, borrowers, around venture capital. Uh, you know, less than 1% of venture capital finance was going to black founders before 2020. Uh, we've seen, you know, a threefold increase uh, in 2021, but that's, you know, still a, a small percentage, less than 3% uh, of venture capital finance is going to black founders. Um, what that infrastructure looks like is a financial system that uh, treats black borrowers fairly, then that's both, you know, the, the people who are making the loans, but also algorithmic bias. It, it is not, mm -hmm. you know, my, my point about this being systemic is even when you have machines making the decisions, they still rate black borrowers to be higher risk yeah. uh, and, and a lower value uh, borrowers. So we have to really go to the entire system of how black people interact with the financial system. You talked about the stock market, but really we need to be building wealth right. uh, and have more disposable income to be able to invest in our future. David Clooney, it's been great to have you. Thank you so much for being here and helping us understand this. It's such an important topic. And again, it's Black History Month, so we are trying to make sure we're covering all aspects of the black experience. Thank you again. Please stay safe. Before we go, I want to acknowledge to everyone at home that I am absolutely aware of the comments made by Joe Rogan. It's not a segment tonight because I actually wanted to take the time in the show to amplify the story of Amir Locke, and that is my privilege as a host. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zolina. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. Medi is up next.
Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.